What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Turnbuckle Topics Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and this is my review of AEW Collision, which took place September 30th, 2023. Now, this episode of AEW Collision took place at the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle, Washington, uh, just where the very next night AEW's Wrestle Dream would take place as well, this first time pay per view in honor of the late Antonio Inoki, who passed away a year to the day. AEW Collision opened up, uh, it was a pretty good show. Opened up with Bullet Club Golds, Rock Hard, Juice Robinson. Uh, with the guns by his side, no, uh, no switchblade Jay White. You know, as we all know, he was attacked at the very end of uh, AEW Dynamite last week, uh, at the end of their episode Wednesday night. And so here we had uh, Andrade El Idolo. And I got to be honest with you guys. Look, AEW ha- has had three pay per views throughout the course of the last six weeks, and you mean to tell me uh, not one of those pay per views? Uh, that took place in London for All In. Uh, the following weekend, we had All Out in Chicago. Then, of course, uh, this past weekend, we had AEW Wrestle Dream in Seattle, Washington. And you could not book Andrade, of all people, in a match. Uh, at least Miro, uh, that's another name I would bring up. At least Miro had that decisive victory against Hobbs uh, at All Out in Chicago. Uh, however, he was not on uh, the All In card or uh, most recently Wrestle Dream. But anyway, uh, we got to do better. We got to get Andrade booked. He's amazing. He's done a great job on Collision since his return after being out several months and uh, since the debut of AEW Collision, right? He's put on some fantastic matches uh, with the likes of uh, Malachi Black and uh, Buddy Matthews and so on. And so this here was no different. Um, so this was a great match. We had the uh, the referee uh, being distracted numerous times uh, throughout the course of this match with the uh, guns ringside for Juice Robinson, which gave him the immediate advantage, and uh, several times when the referee was not looking, the guns would even go and attack Andrade. Fans obviously displeased by their actions, um, you know, their father being Billy Gunn, Mr. Ass. So for the past several months, uh, ever since they've been heels, which is, can't believe it's been the better part of this year already, uh, the fans were yelling out ass boys. Uh, so that's always good to get a nice ass boys chant in there to really irritate them. And throughout the course of this match, what I found really interesting, formerly known as Lana, Uh, C.J. Perry, uh, she was watching this match very closely backstage on the monitor, uh, looking for a new clientele, uh, looking to be a manager or a valet uh, for some upcoming talent in AEW. I'm super curious. I think she'd be a great fit for Andrade. I always thought he's better off, uh, not just due to the language barrier, but I think just in general, he's always better with the manager by his side, specifically female. Selena Vega worked wonders for Andrade uh, during his time in NXT, even on the main roster in WWE. During that time, he was an NXT champion, even a United States champion. And we all know he was capable of doing a hell of a lot more. Unfortunately, that did not happen. But hey, he's not the only one. But I think, you know, pairing him with CJ Perry would be a great look. They've tried since day one, since they brought him into the company two years ago, pairing him up with the likes of Vicky Guerrero and then even uh, Chavo Guerrero for what seemed like just a couple of weeks. I'm not sure exactly what happened to that. Uh, with that whole scenario. Of course, the last year he had Jose, the assistant, who was pretty much just with Roosh now and that whole uh, group over there. So, yeah, I think, again, I think CJ would be a great fit for Andrade. Uh, The way this match wrapped up, though, uh, well, first of all, the referee had enough of the guns, antics. He sent them backstage, sent them packing. We had a couple close near falls for both competitors, but Andrade sealed the deal with his signature hammerlock DDT. Um, But look, Again, I'm hoping to see him get a push, at least some booking on these pay-per-views. I mean, look, you have enough pay-per-views, and Lord knows Tony Khan puts enough matches on these pay-per-views. It's anywhere from, what, 12 to 16 matches. You usually see three or four on the pre-show. Uh, so there's no excuse as to why uh, you cannot fit Andrade in some kind of a significant storyline or feud. So now we're backstage. Tony Schiavone, he's with Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, these two, uh, former rivals, former enemies, now... Uh, not going to say they're the best of friends, but they made an alliance. They made a pact for the time being uh, to go up against the Don Callis family, Kanosuke Takeshita, Sammy Guevara. And uh, for this past weekend, we even saw uh, Will Ospreay. Not, don't believe that's going to be a permanent fixture of the Callis family, uh, but he'll be brought in whenever needed. At least he, he has that you know, good rapport. So anyway, they're backstage and uh, they say, look, we're here on the eve of Wrestle Dream. This is a huge deal. And they have to figure out if they can coexist in the ring after years of not liking each other, simply put. Uh, So they were set for a tag team match on Saturday night, uh, Collision. Omega says, tonight and tomorrow, Jericho, you you have my promise that I do have your back. And Jericho says, I can honestly say that I have your back too. They meant every bit of it. 
uh, it was nearly time for war, you know, going to wrestle dream. Um, they've had, you know, Don Callis and, and his, um, and his slew of people on his team have had Kenny Omega's number, have had Chris Jericho's number, uh, namely Will Ospreay. Now, I love this backstage segment. It felt like an old school golden era promo with Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, of course, with Tony Schiavone, of course, Schiavone and Jericho being, you know, I guess somewhat old school, you could say, uh, WCW days, Schiavone even further back, late 80s. He was even originally with WWF. It really made me care about their matchup on Saturday night against the Gates of Agony before getting to the Don Callis family uh, the next night at Russell Dream. Uh, so that was good. Love that segment. And going to this next bit here, after commercial break, we had Tony Storm's Portrait of a Star. That's the name of this. This is a part two of some series where she's sitting being interviewed with RJ City. And much like uh, the prior week, this segment was a lot of fun. She's ridiculous uh, in the best of ways. Uh, all while being hysterical with her new presentation and this new gimmick, this newfound gimmick as of late, uh, post uh, being with the outcasts, which I thought, you know, her being with the outcasts, I thought it was good for all of them. Her, Soraya, Ruby. Uh, now, Soraya and Ruby Soho seem to still be together with the whole outcast bit. Tony Storm's ventured off into this new way, and initially I was skeptical about it. I was like, oh, they should keep Tony Storm with them a little bit longer. I really like what these three got going on. But I'll tell you what, after seeing, you know, the past month, month and a half, and as it continues to grow, uh, as far as what she has in store for us, this is really a whole different side of Tony Storm. Um, and and uh, I just love to see it. So, uh, but me reiterating this whole segment wouldn't do it justice. You'll have to go back on AEW's YouTube or social media platform. I'm sure, you know, you could check out that minute or two of what she had to say to RJ City. But that was very good. Now, next up, we had a tag team matchup, The Kingdom versus The Best Friends. This was a very physical matchup between the two teams. Now, we saw stereo pile drivers by Chuck and Trent, but Beretta, however, was not able to keep Bennett down for the three count. Now, uh, Mike Bennett, he's been ridiculous. I don't know what it is as of late. He likes punching people in the crotch. Maybe that's his new thing. So Bennett hit Trent and Chuck with a low blow while the referee wasn't looking, uh, leading to the eventual win for the kingdom. So, uh, you know, it's always nice getting a victory. I get it. Sometimes it calls for by any means necessary, but I don't know about punching your opponent in the crotch is the way to go. Obviously, the ref didn't see either of those uh, low blows that took place. Maybe he did afterwards. Check the film, but... Uh, so the Kingdom got a, a win against the best friends. Now here we have Don Callis meeting with Prince Nana. This was backstage. Cameras were not supposed to see this, storyline-wise. Uh, so we, we caught uh, from the commentary uh, team, Alex Marvez, who was the one who crept up upon them. And he, you know, he's, Marvez asked Prince Nana, what was that all about? As Don Callis fled away. And Nana says, once we're finished with Jericho and Omega later tonight, we're in the money. And he repeated it a couple of times. Uh, alluding to what seemed to be a payoff of sorts by Don Callis saying, hey, look, you know, go out there, rough them up and uh, have them ready for us to take down the following night at Wrestle Dream. You know, your boys do the, the initial job and we'll finish it the following night. The Gates of Agony, they're certainly the guys for the job. I mean, these are two big brutes. Um, obviously, they're a problem, right? They, they didn't just hold those uh, Ring of Honor six man tag titles with Brian Cage for 300 plus days just for any old reason, right? They are monsters. Again, I've said it before. I saw them twice uh, this past summer, once for Ring of Honor and once for AEW, and it was really a sight to see. So look, they're more than capable of taking out Jericho and, and Kenny Omega and leaving them bruised and battered for the Don Callis family uh, less than 24 hours later. Um, again, probably some pent-up aggression from losing those six-man tag titles uh, a week, week and a half ago at uh, Rampage Grand Slam. So here we have Julia Hart, currently 27-0, and 0, hasn't lost since April 25th, 2022, ironically enough, to Chris Statlander, who she'll be facing at Wrestle Dream. She's with Brody King, and uh, Julia Hart was going up against uh, Vert Vixen. Now, Vert Vixen, she's very well known on the independent scene. Uh, I've heard a lot about her, seen some of her stuff. She's not exclusive to AEW, but she was here on this very night on Collision. Julia Hart gets the win, as expected, the momentum going into Wrestle Dream, 28-0 now, going up against Chris Statlander again. Uh, the last person to defeat her. And post-match, Julia Hart calls out Chris Statlander and says she doesn't want to wait until tomorrow and that she should come out to the ring right now. Say less. TBS champion Chris Statlander made her way out with Rocky Romero and the best friends. Statlander picks up the microphone and says, the clock is ticking, and at Wrestle Dream, your time is up. So Chris Statlander is not one to play with. Again, I've seen Chris Statlander numerous times uh, throughout her career, seeing her live before her uh, contract with AEW, 
And she, uh, not only can she rough up the women, she uh, can rough up some men too. And not just any old men too. I've seen her have some, some matches with some big boys and uh, she put a hurting on him. So one can only imagine what she'll do to Julia Hart once she finally gets her hands on her, right? So Claudio Casanoli, he challenges anyone to step in his way at WrestleDream. He wants a match. I don't blame the guy. Big show. Um, the challenge was accepted by none other than Josh Barnett, former UFC heavyweight champion. The youngest uh, to ever win that title, by the way, at 24 years old. And uh, also a Seattle, Washington native. So he's got the home, home field advantage, I guess you could say. And uh, that match uh, was said to take place... Uh, at Wrestle Dreams Zero Hour, so during the pre-show. So next up here, we had Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega uh, going up in this tag team match against the Gates of Agony with Prince Nana. And officially or unofficially, I know Chris Jericho is in the midst of having a tag team name trademarked for him and Omega uh, called the Golden Jets. Now, I know the whole golden part is based off of, you know, Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi, their time in New Japan together. They're called the Golden Lovers. And so I know the Golden Jets, the Jets part, has something to do with the fact that Omega and Jericho are both from Winnipeg, and so I think that's how they piece together the whole Golden Jets bit. Anyway, this tag team match, uh, pretty sure this was Jericho and Omega's AEW Collision debut. I know for certain it was Omega's, possibly Jericho as well. Uh, they're, they're typically seen on AEW Dynamite on Wednesday nights, the soft brand split. Nothing official, but that was what seemingly was the case, at least until CM Punk uh, was fired two or three weeks ago. Now it seems like everybody's able to go anywhere they want now. The Young Bucks, we've seen them on Collision as of recent, too. Uh, the people they were trying to keep away, right? We know the whole brawl out situation from last year. So anyway, we saw a beautiful double suplex by Jericho and Omega. Shortly thereafter, a double shoulder tackle, so it looked like they were gelling uh, immediately if they had their doubts. Uh, Omega struck Jericho due to Toa running into him full force, however, knocking Jericho off the apron pretty hard onto the floor. The Gates of Agony, they were beating the hell out of Omega for quite a while there. It looked bad for them, the Golden Jets. Uh, it wasn't looking good for Jericho and Omega, but look, after a while, they got the job done. Jericho made Bishop Khan tap to the walls of Jericho. Post-match, Jericho said, we can, in fact, coexist together. Omega said, this is bigger than Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega. Omega went on to say at WrestleDream, it's time for the original Omega and the original Alpha to spell the beginning of the end for Don Callis and the Don Callis family. So Kenny, Coda, and the Ocho, that's how Jericho referred to them as, going up against Takeshita, Osprey, and Guevara. I've said this before, this is the match I'm most looking forward to at WrestleDream without question. It's about a 14-match card, and uh, maybe by the end of this recording even more, but in all sincerity, um, there's quite a few matches I'm looking forward to at WrestleDream. Of course, Brian, Zack Sabre Jr., again, this match is definitely number one for me, and Swerve Strickland and Hangman Adam Page. So those are probably the top three matches I'm looking forward to at Wrestle Dream, uh, for sure. So next up here, we have The Righteous versus Travis William and Judas Icarus. Uh, now, Travis Williams and Judas Icarus, I really know nothing about. Again, they were brought on much like Vert Vixen from the independent scene for this show. Now, it was essentially a squash match uh, where Vincent pinned Judas in the blink of an eye. Post-match got even uglier. Vincent hit Judas's ankle uh, slash foot with a steel chair. Looked pretty brutal. And, uh, you know, it's obviously a shame that Adam Cole's out and injured. Would have loved to seen an actual two-on-two -two, uh, match at Wrestle Dream uh, with MJF and Cole defending their tag titles against the Righteous, but still going to get MJF in a two-on-one -on handicap match uh, against them. So either way, it's still good that they're that they're having the match and honestly good for the Righteous. It would have sucked to see that match be pulled from the card due to Cole's injury and the three of them not getting the opportunity on such a big stage like Wrestle Dream. Now here we had a main event that consisted... Uh, of eight men. It was called an all-star eight-man tag team match. We've seen this a lot on Collision since its inception in June. A lot of six-man tags, eight-man tags, you know, and it's turned out to be pretty good. I'll be honest. So uh, I was completely here for it. Now we had Zack Sabre Jr. on commentary, uh, the leader of TMDK, and, you know, he was there to pretty much keep an eye on his opponent for the following night, Brian Danielson. So as far as the heels were concerned, we had Absolute Ricky Starks alongside Big Bill and Aussie Open versus the Blackpool Combat Club's Brian Danielson, Wheeler Yuta, and the AEW World Tag Team Champions, FTR. So look, it's an eight-man match. It's just way too much to keep up with. I usually do my best to, you know, tell you how the match went from start to finish for the most part. But look, we'll go towards the finish of this match. All eight men were in the ring. All four babyfaces took out the heels. Uh, with a number of yes kicks, you know, good old Brian Danielson. 
uh, and his move and so on. However, I was surprised that the heels got the victory here. Ricky Starks pinned Dax Harwood. It did look like Cash Wheeler had pulled Dax off before the three count was officially made uh, by referee and uh, Seattle Washington native again, uh, Aubrey Edwards. Um, so there was some confusion there, it looked like, but the match was over. Uh, you know, they, they didn't go back to the tape and see what happened. The match was over. Definitely a moment of confusion for many of those in the ring. And even the crowd looked a little stunned. Like, I don't think the three count was made. I think Cash pulled him off in time. So that was that was how that went. So Zack Sabre Jr. gets in the center of the ring, face-to-face, toe-to-toe with Brian Danielson. Sabre tells Brian, 24 hours, then pushes him. Brian proceeds to slap Sabre in the face. Sabre went at Brian Danielson, nearly locked him in a submission maneuver before Zack was able to escape the ring. So, you know, he got lucky. And look, these are two absolute... Uh, amazing technical wrestlers, and this is for the title, right? There may not be a championship on the line for this match, but a title, in fact, of best technical wrestler in the world. Uh, so we've been waiting for this one for quite some time. Glad to see it's taking place at Wrestle Dream, about 15 or 16 months after it was initially uh, planned to take place at Forbidden Door in 2022 in Chicago. Danielson was hurt, of course. That's why, uh, you know, even on commentary, Zack Sabre Jr. called Daniel Bryan, or Brian Danielson, rather. He called him Brittle Bryan. And so uh, we were supposed to get this match June of 2022. Of course, that, w- that ended up being Claudio Castagnoli's uh, debut with AEW, taking on Zack Sabre Jr. in place of Bryan. And look at that. That worked out well. Claudio and Bryan, both members of the Blackpool Combat Club. So um, that was pretty much AEW Collision in its entirety. And a, a pretty good lead-up show. Nice go-home show. Uh, for less than 24 hours, uh, we'd get Wrestle Dream, right? Wrestle Dream, Seattle, Washington, big show, again, honorary show uh, for Antonio Inoki in honor of him. So um, uh, an amazing card, 14 matches, four on the pre-show, 10 on the main, numerous titles being defended, and uh, even the matches that don't have titles uh, at stake. Uh, look, I, I mentioned three of the matches that are my favorite that I'm looking most forward to don't even have titles uh, up for grabs. Again, that six-man tag with the Don Callis faction, a Don Callis family, rather. Uh, then you have Jericho, Omega, and Ibushi. Amazing. Then you have Swerve Strickland finally getting on a pay-per-view. Long overdue, but better late than never, I suppose. Uh, I was feeling about Swerve how I felt like for Andrade for months on end. Like, why aren't these guys like Swerve Strickland and uh, Andrade and Miro being showcased on pay-per-views? They're all amazing. Not just because they came over from WWE. That has nothing to do with it. It's a simple fact of they're great. Not only do they have an amazing look, uh, they can, you know, they can go on the mic and they get it done. So, you know, glad to see Strickland got an opportunity against Hangman. And then the third uh, match I was mentioning, you know, uh, Brian Danielson versus Zack Sabre Jr. So it's top three uh, for sure. But solid card again, uh, 10 on the main card and uh, Wrestle Dream looking pretty amazing. So I want to thank all of you for tuning in to the Turnbuckle Topics podcast. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening.